his name. What do you want to do tonight? Same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world. How to Use Your Secret Power by Ernest Holmes. This audio is brought to you by You Are Creators, Inc. and is free to use and download. Did you ever say to yourself, I wish that I might never again be afraid of anything? Or have you met someone who had such a deep calm and peace that you have thought, how I wish that I might be like that person? Did you ever in some still moment feel as though you could almost reach out and touch something that would make you whole, happy, and complete? I know you have, and I am sure that everyone else has. We are all alike because we are all human beings. You share this feeling with every other person, and you instinctively know that there is something you ought to be able to tune into which could make everything right, not only for yourself, but for others and for the whole world. It is said that Jesus, walking through the multitudes, diffused a healing power which touched people into wholeness by its divine presence. His command stilled the wind and wave. His knowledge of spiritual law fed the thousands. His consciousness of peace calmed the troubled mind. His love was a healing balm to the sick. Have you asked yourself, why can't I perform these same miracles? Why can't I live a life of magic? I believe everyone has. We do not know how Jesus acquired his wonderful faith, but he must have had moments of doubt and misgivings, just as we all do. He must have experienced uncertainty, just as you and I. But unlike most of us, he triumphed. He walked over the waters of doubt, the waves of confusion, and the tempest of fear. He said, in effect, if you wish to do what I am doing, follow the few simple truths I have given you. I have told you that the kingdom of God is at hand. You do not see it because your eyes are so filled with tears that you cannot see. Your ears are so dulled with confusion that you cannot hear. Your minds are so weighted down with doubt that you cannot understand. What was his remedy for all of this? Open your spiritual eyes. Listen with the inner ear. Open your minds. What is it that we are to open our eyes, our ears, and our minds to? What is it that we must see, hear, and understand? It is this. Life flows into everything through everything. It passes into every human event and translates itself through every human act. If you learn to think of life as flowing through your every action, you will soon discover that the things you give your attention to are quickened with new energy, for you are breathing the very essence of being into them. You can think yourself into being unhappy and depressed, or you can think yourself into being glad. Did it ever occur to you that you can also think yourself into being well, into being prosperous, that you can think yourself into success, well, you can if you believe in the law of life and use it rightly. But you must learn to use it affirmatively. You must learn to identify yourself with your desires. Just as gravitational force holds physical objects in place, so there is another kind of force that operates on your thinking and tends to bring into our experience those things which we hold in mind. This explains why faith is effective, because faith is an affirmative attitude of mind, which uses the creative power of thought constructively. It gives us a key to the teachings of Jesus about prayer. We can use the laws of nature consciously and decide what we want them to do for us. But we are not these laws. They are greater than we are. We may have implicit confidence in them because we know they will never fail. We know that when we plant a certain kind of seed, we will get a certain kind of plant. We know that when we mix certain colors together, we will get another color. We do the planting and the mixing, but nature produces the results. 
If we can keep these simple thoughts in mind and come to realize that the creative power or our thought is a power that we take out of nature rather than put in, it will be a great help to us. We are surrounded by a law of mind which acts on our thought. This is the security of our faith and the answer to prayer. To Jesus, spiritual laws were just as real as physical ones are to us. He knew that there is a silent, invisible, creative force which acts on us and through us at all times, whether we believe it or not. And His purpose and mission in life was to show us that these laws exist, what they are and how they work, and how to use them in such a way that only good will result. Jesus never said that it is wrong to be happy. He never intimated that God wishes us to be sick or poor or disconsolate. Quite the reverse. He used spiritual power for every conceivable purpose, for what we call small things as well as big things. And he said that everything he did was an example for us to follow. And that if we do, definite signs will follow our own belief, our faith, and our acceptance. You must become the master of your own thinking. This is the only way you can realize freedom and joy. Therefore, you will have to turn your thoughts away from lack, want, and limitation, and let them dwell on good. Make yourself do this. Learn to think about what you wish to become. You are a thinking center in life, and the chief characteristic of the law of life is that it responds to thought. Your slightest thought set up a vibration in it, sets its creative intelligence in motion, and causes it to create circumstances for you which will correspond to your thought. If you think of life as always bringing to you everything you need, you will have formed a partnership with the invisible, which will prosper you in everything you do. If you think of the organs and functions of your body as activities of life, then automatically you will benefit physically. The spiritual gifts which people have so earnestly sought after are not something that God has withheld from man. Quite the reverse. They are something which man, in his ignorance, has withheld from himself. Life is not vindictive. It is not withholding anything from you. Every longing and yearning you have ever had, every secret desire of your soul, every constructive ambition you have ever had is a whispering of this life assuring you that you are one with it. You are a manifestation, a personification of it. You are a center where life passing through you becomes definite, distinct, unique individual. There is no one else like you in all the universe, and there never will be. If you will take time daily to sense the presence of life within you, to believe in it, to accept it, it will not be long before the life which you have known will gradually disappear and something new will be born, a bigger, better, and more perfect you. You will pass from death into life from lack and want into greater freedom, from fear into faith. From a sense of being alone, you will pass into the realization of oneness with everything, and you will rejoice in this oneness. There may be some who think that before they can accept this position, they must become profound philosophers, spiritual sages, or men of such deep scientific knowledge that they stand apart from the rest of the world. This is not true. What the wisest have known is only a little more than you and I know. They cannot answer your questions for you. You will have to answer them for yourself. Even the best man who ever lived could not live for you. You will have to live for yourself. You do not have to borrow power from anyone. Every man is some part of God, whether or not he knows it or believes it but we hypnotize ourselves into thinking that we are incomplete and imperfect. We identify ourselves with the fantastic pictures of our morbid dreams, but the ropes that bind us are ropes of sand. To understand that our faith is operated on by a natural law 
gives us the key to the situation. But it isn't enough just to believe in a principle. This is only the starting point. Principles have to be used if they are going to produce definite results for us. And whether the principles are physical, mental, or spiritual makes no difference. It isn't enough to say that faith can do anything, for most people already believe this. What we have to do is not only to realize that faith can do things, we have to find out how faith is acquired, and then we have to use it for definite purposes. To merely state that you believe that God is all there is will not necessarily cause anything to happen. But when you believe that God is all there is, and when you have implicit confidence in the law of good, and when you use this belief for a definite purpose, then something will happen. And the reason why it happens is that you are surrounded by a creative power, a creative mind, or a creative principle, whatever you choose to call it. You are surrounded by such a creative power which actually does operate on your thinking. This is the key to the whole situation. Let us then learn to make known our request with thanksgiving and in acceptance. And having done this in that silent communion of our soul with its source, let us believe that the law of good will do the rest. If then we can come to see that such a law exists, and that we are using a power greater than we are, we shall at once be relieved of any sense of responsibility about it, as though we had to make the law work. For we do not sit around holding thoughts or trying to compel things to happen. As a matter of fact, this would defeat the very purpose we wish to accomplish. We can no more make the law of mind creative than we can compel an acorn to become an oak. We do not hold thoughts over the acorn, nor do we visualize an oak tree. What we do is plant an acorn and let nature create the oak tree for us. This invisible force was real to Jesus. He had implicit faith in it. And because he did, all those things which have seemed so miraculous followed. He was a spiritual scientist who had come to understand that there is a universal principle of mind, a creative intelligence which acted on his faith and conviction. He could tell the paralyzed man to get up and walk, turn the water into wine, and multiply the loaves and fishes by a process which to him was just as natural as it would be for us to use any of the laws of nature with which we are familiar. He used a power which all people have, but which few people are aware of. And he plainly told his friends that they could do the same thing. Some of his immediate followers did experience the same miraculous signs following their belief. And throughout the ages, these signs have followed many people's belief. You are in a divine partnership with the giver of all life. God, the living spirit, almighty and ever present. Therefore, say to yourself quietly, but with deep conviction. I now accept my divine birthright. I now consciously enter into my partnership with love, with peace, with joy, with God. I feel the infinite presence close around me. I feel the warmth, the color, and the radiance of this presence like a living thing in which I am enveloped. I am no longer afraid of life. A deep and abiding sense of calm and of poise flows through me. I have faith to believe that the kingdom of God is at hand. It is right where I am, here, now, today, at this moment. I feel that there is a divine law of good which can, will, and does govern everything. Therefore, I feel that everything in my life that is constructive, everything in my thought that is life-giving, is blessed and prospered. It blesses everyone I meet. It makes glad every situation I find myself in. It brings peace and comfort to everyone I contact. I am united with everything in life, in love, in peace and joy. And I know that the presence of love and life gently lead me and all others, guiding, guarding, sustaining, upholding, 
now and forever.